A second point is the president's 2020 goal is very aggressive. Um, we are now at about 41% attainment. In order to be first in the world by 2020, we have to move that needle a lot, not just incrementally, but we have to move it logarithmically uh, to 60, over 60%. Because uh, the nations who are in the top three, we're 16 now, but the nations who are in the top three are at 60%, 61%. And it's not so much that we gain the first place, but it's that we really gain a place of educational propelling for every person within the United States. And so in order to move that lever, uh, community co colleges are educating more and more of our students. Uh, we have 20 million uh, students in higher education, or in post-secondary education today. Seven million of them are in, are in the community college system. And when we look at, uh, as becoming first in the world in 60%, that means we need 10 million more college graduates by 2020. And two-thirds of them have to be adults because the demographics don't make it if you just use students who are graduating from college, I mean from high school. So one-third can be the students who are graduating from college and two-thirds have to be adults returning uh, to either get their first post-secondary education certificate or some kind of training development or uh, uh, associate degree are to uh, you know to get some kind of a degree that will allow them to go to a four-year degree so and the community college culture is much more open to that population our four-year institutions are still in, so, in many ways some have changed more dramatically than others but in many ways they're still attuned to the student who comes straight out of high school and so we rely on the community colleges to be a, really effective with that group, and that's a major population that we have to somehow educate. My third lever is affordability. Many students are choosing uh, not because it's, it's uh, lower in quality, but because it's more affordable to them to spend the tuition that is required for those two years, and if they want to go on for four years, uh, it just allows that opportunity to be much more within their financial reality. And so I think it's affordability. I think it's the way community colleges really are very open and uh, a community that really does um, support the adult student. And I also think it's because more and more students are choosing the community college pathway that, and, and they're addressing the populations that we're least successful with. Um, it, it's critical that we can help community co colleges be more effective. It's critical. I believe that the model, the achieving the dream model, uh, from what I know about what makes transformational change in education, and I've had the opportunity to be president of two institutions and a third organization where uh, the requirement was some kind of transformational change. And I know I've learned both from mistakes and successes what works and what doesn't work. Uh, and I believe that their model is really a, a, a model that has tremendous potential for success. They start with a leader. There's got to be commitment from the leadership. That's the only way you drive cult cultural change. And they know the significance. You, it can't be a project. There's no silver bullet in this. There's no quick win. So it can't just be put a bridge program in, in your school and that's going to really uh, help students bridge from high school to, uh, uh, to post-secondary uh, or to college. It can't be a learning community. It can't just be getting the uh, d developmental education piece right. It's got to be a cultural change. And the leader, the president, is the one who drives that, who says to the institution, we, are, we don't win unless every student wins. That's got to be the driving motivation, and that has to come from the leader. And I, I see that in the Achieving the Dream model. The second thing is the model is very data dependent. They're extremely, uh, uh, they, they build their strategies around what evidence shows. And so data is critical. And we all know that, you know, it's very nice to talk anecdotally about things, but we really don't know what works until we do the numbers and look at how this strategy is, is or is not working. And so I think that their, their data element, they make data such a key element, is extremely vital and important. And <clears throat> the third thing 
um, that they do is they really build it around what's working for students. They make the student not necessarily, uh, you know, we, we in higher education uh, have really relied on inputs as our place of assessment. You know, if, if we're giving good inpu inputs, if we give a good lecture, then everybody's learning. But that, we, we know that doesn't work. That doesn't work. And what Achieving the Dream does is it really uh, makes, forces institutions, and maybe not forces, but gives ins institutions the kind of supports, the kind of, of permission to not test your effectiveness by the inputs you're doing, have so many uh, uh, books in your library, or uh, do so many lectures, or whatever, but by what the student outcomes are. You cannot tell me that there aren't ways in your institution to do things more efficiently, because I know there are. There are. There are ways. And sometimes, you know, those ways are hard to get buy-in. Uh, but, you know, there, it, it, it's, it's no longer become a choice. The choice is to make college affordable. And if we all don't, in some way, embrace that choice, then students will lose, our nation will lose. And our world will lose in the end. Uh, and we looked at bridge programs, at learning communities, at advising, coaching, and mentoring. Uh, and we had practitioners there from the institutions. And it was kind of a common, uh, a, a dual conversation together. The researchers presented their findings. And then they really, in uh, round tables of about 8 to 10, they really kind of vetted the, those findings in terms of what, what works in practice. And we had policy experts in those same conversations. And we're looking at uh, gleaning now the lessons from that. Uh, reading the, uh, we had a recorder at every table. And, and so we're going to uh, uh, re, uh, look at the conversations that happened at every table and look at the themes. And then we want to get those themes out there. What works and what doesn't work? It's, it's going to be as important for institutions to know what doesn't work with bridge pro programs? What doesn't work with learning communities? So that people aren't putting resources, you know, redirecting, you know, very precious resources to something that is not going to work in the long term. Uh, and so that, that's another avenue uh, that we're, uh, uh, you know, wanting to put forth. And we're also looking at policy issues uh, that ho hopefully can be uh, uh, very effective in terms of the completion agenda itself, and redirecting some of the uh, federal programs like Title V and, and, and the TRIO programs. And the FIPSI program, we want to turn that into what we're calling a first in the world uh, pro program for innovative practices that in institutions are doing, uh, or that want to test. They want to test these programs uh, that really address completion and affordability. So those are some of the things um, that the federal government is. And of course, our, our, our real strong proponent and uh, dear to our heart is the Pell Grant. We want to maintain that level of Pell Grant and actually it's scheduled to be increased. There's American Opportunity Tax Credit for families to get a rebate on their taxes for paying tuition. We want that to be made permanent. It's scheduled to go away in a year or two and we want it to be made uh, permanent. So we're trying to work on the affordability piece on the institutional strategy piece. And we just, uh, in this past March, we developed and uh, uh, gave out a toolkit for states, what states can do on the completion agenda. So this has really been kind of a concerted and dynamic effort throughout the Department of Education. And it really has continued to put post-secondary education in a national lens, which I think is terrific. And I think it's really the lens that our nation needs in terms of not only uh, uh, creating a, a, a better economy, it's, it's prosperity over all levels, social, economic, civic, and building a better democracy, and uh, building a real citizenry that feels like they have the opportunity to make a difference because they have, they're empowered with both the knowledge and the strategic uh, uh, communication and critical thinking skills that they need to make a difference.